E3 2016 is finally here and it's basically Christmas for Dishonored fans. So in this video, we're going to bring you new things you need to know about Dishonored 2. And we uncovered something somewhere you probably didn't expect, so you're definitely going to want to stay with this video. First off, welcome to Karnaka. The Rat Plague was 15 years ago, and although the game will start in Dunwall, you'll be reclaiming what is yours, that's the game's tagline, reclaim what's yours, in the city of Karnaka, on the island of Sirkonos. At E3, we found out the game starts in Dunwall, and then something life-changing happens. Sound familiar? Well, the game's still called Dishonored. This place is to the south of Dunwall, and it's hotter. It's the southernmost city on the island, and you can see that heat's influence over everything. That's an overseer right there, and though I don't envy his body temperature, it's certainly a lighter uniform than the ones in Dunwall. But no worries, it does look like Arcane Studios will retain their title of Original Kings of Nightmare Fuel, and it looks a lot like over the 15 years between the two games, the overseers became, well, supercharged. They went from being spooky terrifying to being imposing terrifying. It's as if they were all given the super soldier serum and Hydra uniforms. The overseers are at war with a gang called the Howlers. That in itself isn't new information, but we learned that you're going to be able to choose one of the two to align with in certain ways to progress the story. The overseers being a totalitarian ass military organization that's a wing of the Abbey of the Everyman. I don't know, they kind of freak me out. I'll be honest, I don't know that they were intended to be jump scares in the first one, but they would always be jump scares for me in the first one. But the Howlers, they're supposedly ruthless and don't really care what happens to innocents, so you're probably not really going to be given an option that sounds particularly good, but Dishonored likes to play things morally gray, and I would say that that's par for the course. Fortunately, you are given the option to not align with either of them, and to that I say Say good. Down with the two-party system. Other delicious stuff is the ornate version of technology that we see everywhere in this game. Also, they're definitely ahead of us in their implementation of solar power. What 15 years can do, right? Arcane didn't address the insects a whole lot, which I think was pretty intentional, on account they're rather present in all of the footage that we've seen of the game from today back to last year. Something else Arcane just happened to let slip. Dishonored 2 starts and ends in Dunwall, but most of the action takes place here in Karnaka. That's right, the action starts here, but it also ends here. That implies an incredibly far-reaching plot, because if it stays true to its namesake, you will be dishonored at the start of the game, and exiled, perhaps, to Karnaka. The Wall of Light, which is basically an electric fence without the fence, is making a return, now powered by wind energy, which is a much cleaner and more humane way to power the devices that burn people to a sizzling ash. It's funny because it's not actually humane or clean, being that it kills people and when they die, they leave behind ash, which is pretty much dirt. And somebody's got to clean that ash up. That's all I'm saying. But let's talk powers. Corvo will retain his powers from the first game, albeit upgraded, and you will have the ability to upgrade all of those via an asymmetric tree that supposedly will allow a large degree of customization. Emily, on the other hand, has some completely new powers. For instance, one called Domino, which links the outcomes of your actions towards one person to several other people of your choosing. Her equivalent of Blink is also somewhat of a crane or a large tentacle arm that pulls you towards things, as opposed to simply teleportation. The cool thing about that is you can actually bring other objects towards you, for instance enemies, and attack them. And here's those results of Domino acting as a conduit for the stun grenade that was placed. Perhaps the most terrifying of Emily's powers is Shadow Walk. It reminds me of that early Game of Thrones scene where one of the 90 kings was slain by some smoke or a shadow or something. Except for you get to control it and that's badass. We also got a good view of the selection screen so we know that there is quite a bit going on. We know you'll still have the heart, it's still going to be Jessamine. So to Depending on who you play as, you're either going to be carrying your dead lover, your dead mother's heart around again. I always found that really weird, but a lot of fun. Especially since in the first one, you were kind of left to speculate. And you're still going to be holding weapons the same way. Some people are a little bit disappointed in this, and some aren't. Meaning the sword is always going to be in the right hand, and everything else will always be in the left hand. In my opinion, it kind of makes it easy to separate what you're doing, but some people disagree. And I get that, and that's what mods are for. Probably one of the more interesting developments that was 
wasn't announced on the stage, but a little later in an interview, is flesh and steel mode. You're literally going to be able to say no to the outsider. As in, I've had enough of your gifts. Get out of my life. I'm not sure how much he'll like that. Although he's the literal representation of a gray morality and tends to just like things if they're interesting. So who knows, he may find that very interesting. As far as stealth goes, that would severely limit what you're able to do. And if you're going to try to do a low chaos playthrough on just flesh and steel, well, I think we can just call that ultra hard mode. Something I really like is that the void and the outsider don't just affect you. There are areas of the game where they will specifically affect the environment. The mansion we're showing right now was affected by a supernatural event and your powers do not work here. However, that doesn't mean it's not supernaturally messy. Time is affected in such a way that you can go back in time and forwards in time and see the mansion in both a vibrant and a dilapidated version of itself. It looks really neat on account it's going to have you solve environmental puzzles related to things that have changed over the period of time, as well as give you different options options in handling the enemies roaming the area. Now I think the effects present here are really cool and they credit the engine that they built specifically for Dishonored to the Void engine, which is supposedly built on ID Tech 5. They didn't mention at the conference, now that's kind of controversial, some people really don't like ID Tech 5, but from what I've seen, the Void engine looks freaking phenomenal. I will say they've said a lot of times that they would be doing more to improve the non-lethal aspects of the gameplay, but there was definitely not a lot of that shown. Now this is absolutely not a complaint, but we were treated to a kill fest by one Emily Caldwin, and it was graceful and really frickin' cool looking, but they only mentioned it kind of in passing when they were talking about the various powers, which by the way, I'm definitely playing as many types of playthroughs as I can with both characters, but it would have been nice to have that addressed just a little bit more. Non-lethal gameplay tends to be tougher and require a lot more patience, and for me it's just a little bit more satisfying. Not a lot, because let's face it, some carnage is a lot of fun sometimes. We also, most importantly, got a release date! November 11th, we're finally going to return to the gorgeous steampunk Victorian Empire of Dunwall. And because it worked so well with Fallout, they're doing a collector's edition. Now the collector's edition comes with some really cool stuff, including including Corvo's mask and Emily's ring, and who could possibly not want both of those things? But on top of that, I think we might know the villain thanks to the collector's edition ad. Who is that? That person just looks kind of familiar. It seems to me like I know who that is. Oh, hey there, Delilah. Your last name isn't Caldwin. It's Copper Spoon. And Doubt tracked you down in the Knife of Dunwall only for you to become the main antagonist in the Brigamore Witch's DLCs of the original Dishonored. Guess you weren't permanently vanquished to the Void like we thought. For shame, Dowd, you could have done better. Such a good way of tying it into the original, but as you know, there are twists and turns in a Dishonored plot. Maybe predictably, maybe not. We'll see. Who knows? In the Brigamore Witches, Delilah wanted to possess Emily Caldwin and rule the Empire, and I'm guessing she still harbors similar motives. I think the plot just got very, very thick, though. What do you think about Dishonored 2? Holy shit, guys. Let's meet in the comments. We have so much to talk about and speculate on. November 11th isn't even that far from now. This is exciting. I am very much a Dishonored fan. I am stoked. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like button. And if you're not subscribed, now is a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every single day of the week. And the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. As always, we thank you so much for watching this video. And we will see you again next time right here on Game Ranks.